when I was younger and my kids were younger and I um, forced or coerced or persuaded my husband and the kids to live in Kyoto for a year. I don't know how to do that. Does the which was the best thing we ever did. Over there, there's a vibe. This is a picture of a wedding. I happen to snap wedding family, but this is not my family. This is more like my family, <laughs> except my son, who was probably taking the picture. So the kids were 13 and 15, and here we were dressed in traditional samurai clothing. That's not what we usually wore, of course. What are you? Um, I'm on the right. That's you? Let's see. I better get the pointer out here. <laughs> That's me. <laughs> that's when I was a brunette. And that's my daughter. She was 13. She's now 53. And that's my husband who died a long time ago and who um, was our ticket to living in Japan. Everybody but me was reluctant to go. So, But afterwards, we all appreciated this absolutely amazing experience. It was the best thing I ever did. So, this little piece of amazing land is this um, amazing country. And obviously, the Japanese occupied North Korea and part of Manchuria, as you know, and part of uh, Korea, well, all of Korea, actually. So you can see where it is. and. Also, as you'll learn, it's um, very mountainous, so they always needed room to expand, and that accounts partly for why they started the Second World War. So Jap Japan is bas basically divided into these four sections, Hokkaido in the north, and we'll see some pictures from the snow festival there, and then Honshu is the biggest island with Tokyo and Kyoto. Shikoku is a little tiny island, and then Kyushu is a big island, very tropical. So we have major differences in climate here. And of course, this is where Hiroshima and Nagasaki are. I'm going to talk about the language in a minute, but in Japanese, every, every syllable is accented the same way. So it's not Hiroshima, it's Hiroshima is the correct pronunciation. So it's a volcanic archipelago and it has almost 7,000 islands but those four largest ones are the ones I mentioned. And there it is in the world. It's a little place in the world. Tiny place. And um, so those four islands make up 97% of Japan. Population of 126 million all crammed into this small space. It's the world's 10th largest country in, in population. In Tokyo alone, over 9 million people live. In, in the greater Tokyo area, 35 million people live. So if you get on a subway in, in Tokyo, especially in the morning, they have pushers that push you into the subway. And at no time do your feet ever touch the ground. <laughs> and that's even true in Kyoto and the buses. So Japan, since the war, Japan has maintained a unitary constitutional monarchy, still with an emperor, but an elected legislature called the National Diet. No relation to what we do after Christmas. <laughs> Japan has a very vital, strong economy, the third largest economy in the world after the United States and China. So, although Japan has officially renounced its right to declare war, and this is a samurai because war tradition in Japan is, is ancient, it does maintain a modern military with the world's eighth largest military budget used for self-defense, which it has good reason to worry about such things, and peacekeeping. Japan is a developed country with a high standard of living and high human development index, which means it uses the potential of its people very well. Its population enjoys the highest life expectancy of the, in the world and the third lowest infant mortality of any country. 
So if you want to live long, you should be born Japanese. Mm -hmm. It's an aged society. We're an aging society. European Europe is an aging society. Japan is an aged society. So the, it has the highest proportion of elderly citizens, 30% above 60, and um, a large percentage, 13% 13, 13 over 75. So there are probably lots of Vs there, but um, actually the tradition is for the children to take care of the adults, but that doesn't really happen. So population aging occurs faster in Japan than any other country. This is a graph of the rapidity of the population aging. But the population will fall by 25 million by 20, 000, 2050 as a result of low fertility and high life expectancy. So they have a real problem there. They have a lot of old people, very few babies born, and almost no immigration. So this is a problem. Old people actually are committing crimes so they can go to jail and get uh, a meal, meals and, and a bed because many of them are homeless. As you know, uh, Japan suffered the strongest earthquake in its recorded history that triggered the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear disaster, one of the worst disasters in history which Japan is still getting over. This is a picture of Mount Fuji, Fujiyama, and a beautiful um, sh shrine, Tori, no, not Tori, not Tori. This is a <coughs> typical scene in Tokyo. <laughs> uh, usually your feet touch the ground, but there are mobs of people in Tokyo. Uh, its density is directly above India, but that's just taking the whole country as a whole, but in Japan, in Tokyo, it's very dense. Land prices in the six largest cities in Japan increased 15,000%, 15,000% between 1955 and 1989. So um, people can't afford to live in Tokyo, or if they live in Tokyo, it's in a little tiny room or a closet or a box. <laughs> there are hotels that are essentially boxes that are shelves where you could rent a shelf and sleep there overnight. So a lot of people have very long commutes to places where they can afford to live. And even then, land is extremely expensive. So this is what contributes to small families. They have very high educational level. They have a devotion to raising healthy children. It's a real job for a mother especially to raise a child. They have to have all kinds of after school education. High achievement levels are demanded. It's, it's very difficult. Plus they have to have skills like playing the violin uh, or flower arrangement or whatever. Um, women are now joining the labor force more than ever. When I was there it was, um, when was it? 50 years ago, whenever it was, and uh, no, 40, 30 years ago. And there were very few women in the labor force, and now there are a lot of them. Very small living spaces, which don't contribute to large families. Um, they know about the problems of overpopulation, so they are contributing to lowering the population to the extent that they're going to lower their own population. And the high cost of childcare and education, even though uh, most education is free. All the extra education that the kids get and childcare is very expensive. And abortion has been available in Japan freely and legally for many, many years. The pill has not been. Japan did not think that the pill was safe for women to use, and so it wasn't available for a long time. But contraception is. Um, so this is the life expectancy at birth, 82 years for women, the highest in the world. And the law is changed so that the uh, population will not decrease so precipitously. Fathers get uh, up to eight weeks of leave after the birth of a child. Employees with uh, little kids have family allowances. 
they get overtime um, on the employee's request, and they're limited to uh, working late at night if they have to take care of their families. So this is my daughter when she was 13. She's now, as I said, 53. You've seen her in my um, films about India. We went to India together last year. She has two children, and we're actually taking a trip to Chile soon. This is just one temple. There are more than 1,600 temples in Kyoto. It was the ancient capital. It's known for its gardens, its temples, its shrines, its refinement, its mm -hmm. tradition. It has uh, about the same population as San Diego, city of San Diego. The first YouTube I showed was about Kyoto, and we don't have time for me to show the whole thing, but it does show the ancient parts, which are not immediately obvious because it's a big bustling city with a lot of traffic. Japanese food, I showed also bef uh, while you were coming in a movie about the uh, YouTube about the food, but it's uh, amazing presentations usually, very seasonal, very fresh food, fish and vegetables used to be central, now the Japanese love meat and of course they're dying of heart disease. The amazing thing to us was the number, the variety of restaurants. These, this is a very fancy restaurant, but we had a noodle restaurant down the street. We had several noodle restaurants. We had fish restaurants. We had um, uh, fugu restaurants. Fugu is that poisonous fish that a lot of husbands die of every year if their wives don't know how to take the poison out or forget to take the poison out. <laughs> the fugu restaurants are all certified to or, take the poison. Eight. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, I ate fugu too. It's almost tasteless. In fact, I think fugu represents the Japanese aesthetic. It's very, very subtle. The taste is so subtle that you hardly can taste it. It's extremely expensive. And it's sort of like Japanese theater. Well, kabuki is not subtle, but no, it's very subtle theater. A lot of interpersonal relationships between people are very subtle. People in Japan hardly ever say no. But they have different ways of saying no. It's very interesting. And if you go on a bus and everybody has their eyes lowered, of course they're looking at you because you're a foreigner. But you could go there completely naked. Nobody would say a word. But they would all have it registered that you're there. But nobody would say anything. So the subtlety of fugu, I think, is symptomatic of the way the whole culture works. This is um, a YouTube, which I'm going to pass on, and we'll show it if we have time later. Oops, there it is. Well, there it is. The highly refined style of dining known as kaiseki has evolved to become the ultimate expression of Japanese cuisine. Okay, I'm going to skip that. The, the thing about Kaiseki is, is a lot of small courses, beautifully presented, highly seasonal, uh, again, very subtle tastes. <clears throat> the other thing we discovered was the martial arts. I had done some um, karate before I went to Japan. I didn't do it when I was there. I did a lot of other things. So. But it's so interesting, again, reflecting the Japanese culture, what the ethics, the dojo is where you do martial arts. Courtesy, cleanliness, and diligence. Arlene mentioned to me that it, the country is so clean that you can eat off the street. Cleanliness is a big thing. If you go into the bath, the Japanese bath, the women, I mean, you wash before you go into the bath, you wash, you wash, you wash, and women actually shave the hair off their forehead cleanliness, and that's, that's not even cleanliness, but very big thing. Diligence, courtesy, that's what you see in Japan. It's not always what you see, because we know that the Japanese occupation of the countries where they were was brutal. Every, every country, Korea, Manchuria, brutal occupation. But interpersonally, people are very nice, very gentle, extremely polite. 
This is what they. Can, this is what is important in a dojo: purify your mind, cultivating the power of perseverance. This is a Japanese character, so characteristic. I strengthen your body in overcoming the difficulties that arise during training. Don't give up; just overcome. The dojo is a place where courage is fostered, and superior human nature is bred through the ecstasy of sweating and hard work. It is a sacred place where the human spirit. Is polished. There's so much bowing and so much respect for the sensei, the teacher. It's really amazing. And I, my karate, of course, was in the United States, but even there, there was bowing, there was respect, there was uh, reverence almost. Um, seniors, not us, but uh, seniors in karate and black belts are well aware of these facts. Therefore, beginners are requested to help make the dojo a sacred place by keeping in the mind the above precepts and observing the following. And then there's a bunch of them. Again, cleanliness starts out. We found that there were festivals, especially in Kyoto and around Kyoto, almost every weekend. And actually, you could go to a hotel and get a list of the, where the festivals were and which festivals they, they are. Arlene, in her book about her visit to Japan, has a festival of the aged in Tokyo. I don't think we saw that one, but I sort of ran out of what the names of the festivals were. They were all different, and they're based on the Shinto religion. This is the soul of dead insects. <laughs> and they have lit candles, and they're uh, going to the graveyard, <coughs> praying for the souls of dead insects. There's a festival, you know, when you, when you do Japanese calligraphy, or when you write in Japanese, it's with a brush. And once a year, you throw away your brushes, and there's a festival for the throwing away of brushes. Festival for everything. It's very Shinto, because in Shinto, everything has a spirituality. Same festival. And there's a tremendous reverence for nature. Nature, uh, at least ostensibly, nature is uh, cultivated and cherished even though you hardly see any in a place like Tokyo. It's also very trashed. <laughs> As I was saying to somebody in Kyoto, we live near Mount Hiei, and on the top, which is a sacred mountain, and on the top, which is very sacred, are beer cans and used condoms and all kinds of things. So uh, this, it's a very paradoxical country, but what I'm telling you is sort of the basics of what they treasure. Less than 12% of Japan is arable land. This is remarkable. This population lives on only 12% of this land that they have, which is not very much to begin with. They have very few natural resources except water and their people. There are many uh, catastrophes. Tsunamis, typhoons, volcanoes, earthquakes. So no natural resources, but many natural catastrophes. And most of the country is mountainous. This is a famous children's figure. So I'm just showing you how mountainous it is. There are cable cars all over the place to get from one place to another, and also steep steps. The Japanese language is very difficult. It's not like Chinese. It's not tonal. So that's good. And if you get an English translation, then it is like it's pronounced, and every syllable is pronounced the same emphasis. So it's not sake that we drink. It's sake. It's not karate. It's karate. So they have a, a one written language for foreign words and one written language for Japanese words, and then they also use kanji, the, Jap the Chinese language, of ideographs. So my children didn't go to a regular Japanese school because at age 13 and 15, they would have had to know a thousand kanji characters, but they did learn hiragana and katakana. I went to school to learn spoken Japanese, but I was completely illiterate. I couldn't read anything. So I didn't know if I was going into a ladies' room or a dry cleaners. Mm -hmm. But the interesting thing about some of these pictographs, 
is that they sort of look like the thing that they're depicting. So if you got used to seeing the ladies' room, it looked like a woman with her legs crossed. So that, that I, I got that, but the rest of it, I had no idea. This is the uh, kanji characters, so three alphabets. Kanji, which is Japanese, uh, Chinese, essentially. Hiragana. Romaji, which is the English translation and the meaning of it. So that's, that's the counting. So when you see Ichiban, that means number one, number one, whatever, sake or meat or whatever. Who's that? That's not part of my script. This is a Tori, which is usually in a Shinto shrine. Tran marks the transition from the profane to the sacred. Everything is symbolic in Japan. Here's some women and pseudo women. These are Mako, the um, junior geisha, and they wear these very uh, elaborate obis. They always look gorgeous. They have their hair done like this, and they ride in carriages, and especially in Kyoto. Women in, in Tokyo wear pretty wild and interesting fashions. Not so much in Kyoto, but Tokyo. <laughs> and cross-dressing is not uncommon. And of course, in Kabuki and No theater, all the theaters, men play women's parts. So uh, for men to cross-dress is not unusual at all. Weddings are very elaborate. <laughs> Under her white garment is a red garment, another garment. She can hardly move. Her obi weighs about 20 pounds, and her headdress is very heavy. Forget going to the bathroom on your wedding day. It's not possible. So this is very interesting. Was When I was there, this was not true. It's true now. A growing number of young women prefer to stay unmarried in Japan. The development often viewed as a rebellion against their traditional image of women's roles as wife and mother. A hard, a very hard role. The men come home drunk at midnight. <laughs> they want their shoes taken off. They want to be fed. They want to be put to bed. <laughs> and especially if you have a son, it's a lot of work to raise a son with all the graces that that kid needs to survive. So here, 54% of Japanese women in their 20s were still single. That was unheard of when I was there. And um, only 30% in 1985, which is more like the year I was there, the year that was. A woman's kimono may easily exceed $10,000. The silk. Did anybody see the kimono exhibit um, at the San Diego Museum of Art at the Timken a few years ago? Nancy and I saw it together, yeah. The kimonos were uh, works of art is just um, a cliche to describe them. They were absolutely amazing. And some of these kimonos are like that. They're all hand-painted, hand-embroidered, beautiful silk, heavy silk. Uh, the kimono, the undergarments, which is a whole other industry. The obi, this is a particularly elaborate obi. The socks, the shoes, the whole outfit could cost up to $20,000. Not necessarily. I mean, there are um, pseudo silks, uh, rayon kimonos. My daughter had one, I had one. And then there's one kimo used kimono sale at the Toji Shrine, one Saturday a month. So all the foreigners rushed to get these beautiful used kimonos that a Japanese woman wouldn't wear because they're too old. I mean, the kimonos. Japanese gardens, a whole other <laughs> art form, are traditional. They usually characterize uh, miniature landscapes. So the gardens of the emperors and others were for designed for recreation and aesthetic pleasure, while the gardens of Buddhist temples were designed for contemplation and meditation. I hope you've all been to the Japanese gardens in Balboa Park. We are very lucky to have such a treasure in our own backyard. 
and they're so varied, and they they look like this one looks casual, but it's not casual at all. It's very carefully planned and tended. Um, I don't know what, what happened to these guys, but they lost their head. <laughs> um, Japanese architecture is a whole other thing, and of course, Japanese architecture in its amazing simplicity, not, not always simple, but it is very, can be very simple, influenced Frank Lloyd Wright when he went to Japan. And of course, he built the Imperial Hotel, which no longer exists. This is the Golden Temple in, in Kyoto. Um, so they were wooden structures, which means that they may be 1,300 years old, but it also means that they've been rebuilt maybe 25 times. Not because Kyoto was bombed during the war, but because they burn. And you'll see why in a minute. So they have sliding doors, which expands your space. They have tatami floors, straw floors, and there's no furniture. So people sit on the floors, they sit on, they sleep on futons, and the futons are stored at night. So it gives the uh, illusion of spaciousness when actually the rooms are small and the, and the buildings are very small. Now, uh, Japanese architecture and Western architecture are very well melded into their modern architecture. But also, the traditional is still very apparent. It's a castle. That's not a simple structure. Um, this, these photographs that I had from way back, most of them didn't survive, but some of them did, and they're sort of distorted. But at that time we lived there, there was a rice field next to our house. We were in the middle of the city, but still there was a rice field. And uh, we saw <laughs> a lot of men peeing into the rice field every morning. That's sort of incidental. Fertilizer. Fertilizer, yeah. But uh, by the time we left, there was a house being constructed there. And a lot of houses look like this, sort of row houses. And um, when I came back in 2004, our house wasn't even there. Chestnuts are very nicely prized, and so there's a chestnut market. Soft drinks are everywhere. This is what these women are wearing is a part of Japanese folk art. All these little things that they're selling, beautiful chopsticks and chopstick holders, and all these things, their bonnets are considered part of Japanese folk art. That's what minge means, Japanese. Japanese for folk art. This is all Japanese folk art on different surfaces. This is on wood, painted, quite charming, sometimes very whimsical, like them. You could just do an hour on Japanese folk art. It's so interesting. This, I think, is the emperor and empress when they were young, when I was young. So the current emperor is Akito, who's been on the chrysanthemum throne since he was enthroned after his father, the emperor Showa, uh, Hirohito. That was the emperor, you know, the American occupation allowed the emperor to continue on his throne, even though he started the war. Um, it was a very smart move. The role of the Emperor of Japan has been historically alternated between a largely ceremonial, symbolic role, which is what he had after the war, and that of an actual imperial ruler, which is what he had before the war. This is their, their wedding. I can assure you she has not been to the bathroom. <laughs> the Empress is usually chosen from the ordinary citizens of Japan, ah. the royal family. The empress is usually chosen from the ordinary citizens of Japan, not the royal family. Yeah. She, I, that's why I remember something about her being a very well-educated woman, but a commoner. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> so, as I said, we would go to festivals every weekend, almost every weekend, <clears throat> and they're very elaborate. Arlene said that in the Festival of the Ages, the, the um, costumes were kept by the families. 
I assume these costumes were rented, but I, I don't know. It might be a family tradition. Considering how small the houses are, it's amazing that anything was kept. Uh, they have to store the kimonos, they have to store the futons, and there's hardly any storage space at all. There's a lot of storage space under the floor. Under the floor. Uh -huh. Okay, storage space under the floor. Thank you. Somehow, we didn't have that in our house, but maybe we missed it. So what did we do there? So I had to uh, oh, threaten, cajole, whatever the words are, persuade my husband to go there for a year. He was a scientist and uh, was just building up his laboratory at Emory University, but he managed to get a National Science Foundation uh, fellowship to study at Kyoto University, which is the number two university. The universities are ranked. You know, we know that there are prestigious universities in the United States, but it's nothing like the prestige that is accorded to these different universities. So, Kyoto, it's called, um, is number two university, and he worked with a Japanese man. Many Japanese have very fine motor skills, and this, he, my husband was a clinical pharmacologist. They studied the uh, infusion of a rabbit embryo's heart by all these different drugs that they were studying. Minute microscopic patient work, also characteristic of their art forms. Um, my son was 15. Oh, I had a, um, my best friend there, I later became, we became best friends, was a psychologist at Kyoto Institute of Technology. And I had written to all the psychologists in Kyoto, but he was the only one I heard from because I found out later none of the others could actually speak English. And he got his PhD from Columbia, but still had a lot of trouble with English. But he wrote me back and said that I could have an office at Kyoto Institute of Technology because I could take the place of one of the teachers who was studying in America that year. And that's what I did, and I did research there. I didn't do any teaching because, um, although Japanese have eight years of English, they don't understand anything. Excuse me if anybody's offended by that. But at least it was true when I was there. Could read anything. Perfect English could read, write English, but speaking English, no. So my next door office mate, he also taught English there. I mean, I didn't teach English. There. We got beyond good morning, there was no conversation. Fortunately, there was a group of faculty members there who did speak English and who were extremely gracious and helpful in showing us around. That was really a wonderful thing, and they became very good friends. One woman who was on the faculty, I loved her. They were both, and one man, I loved him too. He was an expert in um, kabuki and no theater. Spoke three languages. These people are so amazingly cultured. Amazing. So I really enjoyed my time at uh, Kyoto Institute of Technology. So my son, 15, commuted to Kobe every day, uh, not every day, once once a week, to the Canadian Academy. Uh, and my daughter, 13, went to the Kyoto International School. And both of these schools were started by missionaries. That year I met more missionaries and missionary children than I have ever had seen, heard of in my life. Missionaries love living in Japan. Their children are born in Japan. They speak perfect Japanese. They convert a lot of people to Christianity, who are also Buddhists, who are also Shinto, and they get credit for that so they can stay there. The best part of it is they teach English, and if you learn English in a missionary school, maybe by reading the Bible, you have the best shot at learning English, because learning English in school, as you saw from that alphabet, well, you didn't see, I didn't explain it to you, but every, every word is, the syllable, so it's koka ki ke ku, and you have to put all those syllables into your language, which doesn't translate very well into English. But um, the missionaries do teach very good English. So I was an advisor to the English speaking society at Kyoto Institute of Technology, which was very interesting and a lot of fun. And I mistakenly took them to see Macbeth, 
Um, who was that? Anyway, uh, the um, British Council had movies all the time in English. Of course, they didn't understand word one. So we went back to my house for a discussion. And there was no discussion because they didn't understand it at all. <laughs> uh, it's too bad, though. So I did research on the Japanese perception of black and white. This was during the Civil Rights era. I was a professor at Morehouse College at that time, and the study of black and white was very interesting to me, and especially in Japan. I did a, a, a number of studies that were quite interesting. I could talk about them later, but there's just not time to talk about everything. I also studied Japanese. I did that for six months until finally I was spending so much time on that. When it got to the honorifics, so if you're addressing somebody who's older than you, a woman, or somebody of higher or lower status, your language changes. At that point, I said, that's enough. I'm just a foreigner here, and I um, don't know anything, so I'm just going to skip that part, which gave me a lot more time, because that Japanese course was very difficult. And there were only maybe 10 of us in the class from all over the world, so we didn't all speak English. But it was very hard to keep up with everybody, and if you didn't keep up, it the whole class lagged behind. So it was a lot of work. And then there was this wonderful UNESCO course in four parts, religion, geography, literature, and culture, with four different professors. It was wonderful. And I also practiced Zen Buddhism, which I had learned uh, to practice when, before I left. And then we went to the festivals on the weekend, and we went hiking in the mountains. So these are... Retirement age, I think, is 55 in Japan, so a lot of men have nothing to do after they retire, and I think these festivals keep them entertained. There are Shinto festivals. These are Shinto hats that Shinto priests wear, but these are men in festivals. Very elaborate. Kids in festivals who are wearing masks. Horses in festivals. <laughs> These are all different festivals. I don't remember what they were. Militaristic festivals. At night, little villages would have festivals. And invariably, there would be torches and fires. And these villages were made of wood. I, you know, as a psychologist, there's such a thing as counterphobic behavior when you do exactly the opposite of what you're terribly scared of. I mean, you do what you're scared of. That's what this looked like. The chances of these villages burning down was <laughs> very, very high, and everybody had these torches. This is a torch being set on fire. It scared me. I was <laughs> terrified. Um, as we wandered around, Japan and Kyoto, we were uh, always, often the center of attraction because we were gaijin. Gaijin means outside people or foreigners. And little kids, before they could hardly walk, could point at us and say, gaijin, gaijin. So it's very embedded in the Japanese tradition that their ga gaijin means, gai means outside, jin means person. That's the other thing about the Japanese language. Everything means something. Barbarian. Well, barbarian, well. Gaijin, barbarian. <laughs> Gaijin literally means outside person. Your connotation, barbarian, maybe. The last lecture, well, I, the, I, the, the English Speaking Society asked me to give a final lecture before I left, and I gave it on the word Gaijin because it has a connotation of great deference and respect, also has the connotation of barbarian, and it also, I mean, people, Japanese emulate gaijin. Models for kimonos are all blonde, blue-eyed women. <laughs> so it's a very ambivalent relationship. I have a book called We Japanese. It's a very um, we-they kind of society, but very ambivalent toward gaijin. So anyway, we were very uh, we always attracted a crowd, which was very much fun. And people, can I practice my Japanese? And we were happy. Can I practice my English? We were happy to do that. But my kids' friends 
who were born in Japan got tired of that after they were 15 years old and people were still saying, can I practice my English on you? That was sort of boring, but for us it was a lot of fun. So we would sometimes climb into the mountains or uh, go through the, the woods around Kyoto, get something good to eat. Young people are in, under tremendous pressure to achieve in Japan and get into these top colleges which are seriously ranked. So Tokyo University is uh, numero uno, well, Ichiban. And the Japanese uh, suicide rate among young people is pretty high. And of course that's what mothers do. They prepare the kids for college so they take them to these after-school tutorial classes starting at age five. So we lived in Kyoto and we had a very modest two-story house that was considered the Gaijin house. Um, so people who taught at Kyoto University got this house and the people before us were a Canadian family. And it was right near Mount Hiei, which was a good location, also near a trolley barn. So the trolleys went right past our house, very noisy, called Dentures, the Dentures, and next to that rice field that I showed you. So the Dentures were very noisy. We would be sleeping on the floor under a futon, which was very heavy, and hearing the Dentures at night. So the first week, I had these nightmares <laughs> that I was being rolled over by steamrollers or trolleys or something. <laughs> but you get used to it after a while. So we slept on futons. We did not have a car. It was not necessary. Public transportation is wonderful. Taxis are plentiful, inexpensive. This is back in those days. Anyway, trains, excellent, very good. We had a small refrigerator and two burners, so we had to cook everything on a, um, what is it? <laughs> yes, whatever you said. So we had to shop every day, which was so much fun. My daughter and I would do the shopping, and people would know us. They'd go, your, get your tofu in one place, your fish in another place, your chicken in another place, your sake in another place, your vegetables in another place. And all the merchants would know us, so she went by herself. It was where's your mother? And if I went by myself, where's your daughter? And we had enough Japanese between the two of us so we could do shopping and have little conversations, which was great fun. And we were right close to um, shopping there. And the house came with this amazing English-speaking maid. She spoke better English than any professor that I met anywhere in the country. And she knew all the customs. And several times when I made hideous faux pas, I'll just give you an example, my Zen teacher, um, long story short, died. And I went to see his wife after his death, and I presented her with a beautiful envelope, gold red envelope with money in it, because he had never taken any money. And I came back and told my maid, and she said, what was the color of the envelope? And I told her, oh, God. wrong color. That was uh, birthday or life. Or, you know about this. White. Right? White. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> white. Yeah. White. Yeah. I did that kind of stuff all the time. And if I told her about it, then she would correct me, but it was usually too late. And then if we had guests who would come to the front gate, she would... If she was there, she only came once a week, and she would talk to them in Japanese, find out who they were. We had some very interesting guests, including two neighbors of mine, two women who wanted me to teach them English, which I did. Long, long story there, too. We would always pick up these young men. I assumed they were interested in my daughter. I don't know. So we picked him up at the uh, uh, sumo wrestling. I'll, I'll show you in a minute. And he came over, he would come over fairly often. Strange young guy. I don't know what my daughter's doing, they're showing him pictures or something. And somebody had given us this lovely doll. Mm -hmm. To decorate the house, I put these bamboo curtains on the inside. The Japanese thought that was absolutely gross. Mm -hmm. <laughs> my maid informed me that those curtains go on the outside, not the inside. <laughs> 
I thought they were very pretty. <laughs> so this is some of the mountainous area around uh, our house, even. Beautiful places. This is a little village. We would visit these little villages. So, as I said, the mountains cover 75% of the land surface. There are 25 mountains with peaks over 9,000 feet, which is nothing compared to what Denver has, but the highest is Mount Fuji. Uh, Japan has 285 uh, volcanoes, some of which are active. 20 are active. Earthquakes occur continually. It didn't occur while we were there, fortunately. An average of 1,500 minor shocks per year. And um, the Kanto earthquake in 1923 was one of the world's largest natural disasters where 99,000 people died. 99,000 people. So planes are very few in Japan and small and cover only about 29% of the total land. And most of them are located along the seacoast sea where most people live. This is a big tree. You could sit on a raft in a river and cold buckwheat noodles, soba, would be served to you. Mm. That was such fun. I think my husband was taking the picture. You've heard the expression, if you go into a Japanese restaurant, irashai mase. That's um, classic welcome. If you don't, if they don't tell you irashai mase, you should get a refund. That's what they're supposed to say to you. <laughs> and this is a ryokan where we stayed. Um, ryokan is a guest house, typical Japanese. Tea ceremony, of course, is one of the arts that young women learn. So this is sumo. I somehow fell in love with sumo wrestling. I found it so interesting. And I would watch it on television every opportunity I had. And of course, my tutors were my colleagues at Kyoto Institute of Technology that would tell me about it. And one of them actually took us there to Osaka to see a sumo match. It's very colorful. It's very Shinto, the decorations, the rituals. Of course, the men are gross. They eat yes. huge amounts. So the winner is either the first wrestler to force his opponent to step out of the ring. You'll see that in a minute. Or the first wrestler to force his opponent to touch the ground with any part of the body other than the bottom of his feet. Matches consist of a single round and may last only a few seconds. I'll show you. Very ceremonial. Before each batch goes on about 10 minutes of this ritual, pacing back and forth, throwing salt at each other, also a Shinto ritual. The winner. World Series. They do, not a World Series, but they have an international series. Not the whole world participates, but Hawaii does, I think. In fact, the champion, the year we were there, was a Hawaiian sumo wrestler, Japanese, Hawaiian Japanese. Um, okay, so, so they have, obviously, they're huge, but that doesn't determine who wins. Often a uh, smaller wrestler can outdo a bigger one. Um, let me go to the, um, <laughs> uh, good question. I don't know whether they're included in those life expectancy rates that I showed you. Here we go. I know he's built better than most of us. <laughs> See, he's out. The little older guy got him out. You see a lot of rear ends here. And I'm not showing you all the ritual that goes on between these matches. The matches only take a few seconds. Oh, see, got rid of him fast. And he's dressed in a, in a uh, Shinto priest outfit, the referee. <laughs>
This is a long one. Short one. That's it. That's the whole match. I'm going to stop now, but on this on this uh, tape is a very long one, maybe 50 seconds. Is this the one? No. No, that got hit fast. I'm going to skip this. But. So that's uh, sumo wrestling. This is my husband trying to be a sumo wrestler. <laughs> <laughs> This is where we picked up that young man that liked my daughter or something. So, again, back to karate and karate. Again, these precepts, which I think are amazing. It's not a blood sport. He is human, so am I. It is an imitation of, of self-limitations. Um, if I cannot accomplish, whereas others can, Discard this limitation. Discard this limitation. If, if he practices three times, I must practice five times. If he practices five times, then I will practice seven or ten times. Do not turn to others for help. Mashiach um, Buddha, pay your respects to the Buddha, to the gods and Buddha, but never rely on them. Earnestly cultivate your mind as well as your body and believe in yourself. Karate may be referred to as the conflict within yourself or a lifelong narration, a narrative, a marathon race, which can only be won through your own creative efforts. Isn't that amazing? I think that's just, this is what the Japanese, these are words that Japanese live by. These are just random pictures from different places. There's uh, in the villages a lot of these thatched huts. Roofs have uh, grass growing on them. Tories are very uh, everywhere. My husband walked from our house to Kyoto University. A beautiful walk with deer and shrines and um, when you get to Kyoto University it looks horrible. A lot of graffiti, a lot of people shouting into microphones. Amazingly ugly place. <laughs> so Buddhism has been practiced there since 552 AD. It came from Korea, began in India. And people say it's moving to the West and will eventually get here, which it has gotten here. It's a major influence on Japanese culture, though it, um, in, in Buddhism, Material things are not to be worshipped. They're transient, transient things. They're illusions. Of course, that's not the Japanese way of life. Japanese treasure material things. The more expensive, the better. So, again, another paradox. Only 35% of Japanese identify as Buddhists. The temples are used for burials, for funerals, and for weddings. It's not even true. But very, very rarely. I was lucky enough to make a contact through Alan Watts with a Zen Buddhist priest and his wife in a, in a Japanese temple. And so I, I was able to practice um, Zen Buddhism there. And he, would, uh, he and other um, Zen priests I would, I would learn Zen Buddhism from. So there's at least four different kinds of Buddhism. Zen being more like Quaker and Pure Land being more like Catholicism in terms of its rituals and its fanciness and its um, attachments. And some of these more uh, ritualistic forms of Buddhism see Buddha as a deity, but he was not a deity. He was a plain guy who lived a normal life died a normal death, he was not crucified, there are not statues of him, he's not bleeding, there's not nails in his... It's not very nice to go into a Buddhist temple. Yeah, he lived a very normal life after he sought um, the secret of life. Buddhist priests are not celibate. And um, as I said, you could be a Buddhist, a uh, Shinto, 
and a Christian at the same time. No problem. I don't know anything about Muslims in Japan. They're all around. They're all around. I'm sure they are. Here's some temple architecture. This might be Kamakura. I'm not sure. So it's a Buddhism, non-theistic religion or philosophy. It encompasses a variety of traditions, belief, and spiritual practices, largely based on the teachings attributed to Gautama Buddha. Um, and Buddha simply means the awakened one. That wasn't his name. So Buddhism is a religion to about 300 million people around the world. This Buddha, Buddha of Kamakura is the largest one. Mm -hmm. I don't like him. He's ugly. <laughs> but at the same time, the Buddhist tradition is the military tradition. So there's a samurai warrior. And it's very interesting. The companies train their employees, their top employees, in Buddhism. And they go for a retreat, for maybe a week-long retreat, to learn the art of war and Buddhism at the same time. And one thing that happens is, if you're in a sword fight with somebody, and you're a Buddhist, you are no longer attached to life. Attachment goes in Buddhism. You learn not to be attached to people, to experiences, to things, and to life. I found that very helpful, because I was going up in these cable cars, I was scared to death. <laughs> And I just turned on my Zen Buddhism and I said, hey, it's only life. <laughs> so when um, a company employee goes to a Buddhist uh, workshop, uh, they learn the secrets of attachment or non-attachment. So they're much better loyal workers than if they hadn't learned Buddhism. And a lot of the Buddhist priests and a lot of the Buddhist temples are kept alive by corporations who train their employees that way. Another little paradox. So Shinto is the ethnic religion of the people of Japan. It's sort of a nature religion, defined as an action-centered religion focused on ritual practices to be carried out diligently. You saw the rituals of the souls of dead insects and to establish a connection between present-day Japan and its ancient past which is why these uh, children are dressed like this, which is why all those men were dressed like ancient warriors, priests. Very big in Japan. Here we have more uh, people who are half naked and about to set fire to this torch. There he is. <laughs> and these are young taiko drummers. Taiko is another wonderful <laughs> musical tradition in Japan. more festivals. She's walking her son. And he's about to set fire to these pine boughs. Notice the wooden structure here. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> These are not just one festival, obviously, over a course of a year that we went to see all these festivals. This is a uh, gourd that he's blowing into. Shofar, maybe. The, the um, cemeteries were beautiful. It's only ashes that are buried here, which means, you know, cremation is mandatory because there's so little space, which means you can have uh, the uh, my friend, Mr. Akita's teacher, died right before I came there. I was hoping to study with him, Koji Sato. And we went to his memorial service, and some of his ashes were buried in Kyoto and some in northern, Kyoto, in northern Japan where he was born. So you can do whatever you want to with your ashes. Oh, you could see that cemetery is very crowded like the country is. Here we are having a little picnic and attracting a lot of attention including deer. Mm -hmm. We had deer around our house. Ice cream? I think he's eating ice cream, yes. <laughs> <It looks like. laughs> 
very tame. <laughs> I don't know why these guys are so dressed up. They could be. No, they're not missionaries, no. There are Mormon missionaries in Japan. Quite astonishing. Because they have to learn Japan reading, writing, speaking before they, Japanese before they go. We came across some who were writing these big signs in Japanese and beautiful uh, calligraphy. Very impressive. Are they Japanese? No. They're Mormon Americans on missions. Here we are having a meal. This is in our room. We were put up in a lot of fancy hotels because my husband was considered to be very important. And of course we stayed in a lot of hotels and then we got served in our room. In fact, there were so many servants lurking around, you had to go behind a screen to get dressed and undressed because they were always waiting on you hand and foot. This is how I looked as a brunette. My um, son, this was during the Beatles era, so he now has very short gray hair. <laughs> and, um, well, this was not as common as it would nice have been, but while you're out there in the river eating noodles, these little boats come around. This is a raked garden. This is such a carefully tended garden. It's uh, like old bonsai here. So, no theater. Has anybody seen no theater? Again, one of the great subtleties of the world, because people wear masks, albeit different masks, but the way the head is turned, you can see whether the person is sad or happy just by the shadows on the mask. It's an extremely subtle form of theater. It goes on and on and on. And it's been going on since the 14th century. So uh, in between the plays are Kyogen, which is comedy, I'll show you that. And the no plays are based on traditional uh, literature, usually with a supernatural being. These guys, I don't know who these are. Um, oh, I'll go back to the theater in a minute. But we were there when the cherry blossoms happened. Sakura is cherry blossom, Sakura festival. And so we went and sat under the trees. And it's a very fleeting situation. And they would tell you in the newspaper, on the radio, where the best cherry blossoms are, and you would run to that area. Because the next day, when the winds were blowing, the cherry blossoms would be over in that area. And when the cherry blossoms were falling, it was like snowing. It was so beautiful. And so fleeting, my pleasure. And um, this being, a, this is not snow, of course, these are cherry blossoms. This is a very old slide. It was so much fun. People were drinking sake, like it was going out of style. People would come from all over the place. There was a lot of cross-dressing, a lot of sake, a lot of hospitality. We would be offered people's lunch, their sake, of course, because we were gaijin, too. These are cross-dressed people, people, him playing the shamisen. So wonderful, it's <laughs> so wonderful. Here is, we picked up another young man here. <laughs> um, anyway, that was Cherry Blossom Festival, and it made me appreciate bamboo cops. If you go to a bamboo forest, it's always green, it's always calm, it's always stable, and it retains the roots because the roots spread out so much, it's the best place to be during an earthquake. And after the franticness and the intense beauty of the Cherry Blossom Festival, I sort of ran to the bamboo forest and just sat there because it was so calm and uh, so um, eternal in a way. So we went to a lot of musical concerts. This is Shamisen concert. Shamisen and shakuhachi were my favorite instruments. Shakuhachi means eight hachis, which is a measurement, an old measurement. I first heard it when I was wandering around Kyoto, and I heard this haunting music in a temple and tracked it down to the shakuhachi player. It's a beautiful instrument. So is the shamisen. Uh, archery is another martial art in Japan. 
And I don't know how many of you ever heard of or read Zen and the Art of Archery, anybody? It's a very interesting book written by this German philosopher who studied both um, Zen Buddhism and archery. And in that book, he tells you how to use the principles of Zen Buddhism or Buddhism to become a good archer. And a lot of that depends on attachment. Because if you're very attached to hitting the target, very attached to winning, you don't do nearly as well as if you drop the attachment and just sort of let it flow. It's a very interesting book. Again, not because of the martial art itself, but because of the philosophy behind it. Food. We ate a lot of food. But small portions. They're all small portions. This was meat which we hardly ever ate, but the Japanese loved to entertain us by taking to places where they could eat meat. Japanese did not die of coronary artery disease until they started eating all this meat. We went to Hokkaido for the snow festival. I have to say that in our little house in Kyoto, we were always cold in the winter. It was very humid. We had little space heaters which we couldn't use at night because if they overturned, the whole place would go on fire. So we had these futons on top of us if we had to go to the bathroom. Fortunately, the toilet seats were heated, but still you had to go down these cold steps. And we were never warm in our house. But we were very warm. We went to Hokkaido because we had a very nice hotel in Sapporo. And it was heated. And although it was snowing and it was cold, it was not humid, and the underground in uh, Sapporo are all these shops and restaurants and a whole civilization underground, and they're all heated, unlike in China where nothing is heated. But um, So it was very much fun to go to the snow festival. Here it is snowing, and here's a few people we picked up along the way. Um, I'll accept any answer, I don't know. Um, Alan Watts, as uh, I studied with him, do you know who Alan Watts is? He popularized Zen Buddhism in, in America. He wrote lots and lots of books on Buddhism. And I took classes with him before I went to Japan. And so we corresponded, and so he came over while we were there. And uh, he's quite a character, he used LSD very often, drank a lot of sake but uh, knew a lot about Buddhism. So it was really very great fun to have him there. We took him out to restaurants. He had forgotten his Japanese, so I was the expert in Japanese, as were the kids. <laughs> he died, actually, a couple of months after his visit to us. Is he Japanese? No, he's American, sort of during the hippie era. This was a view from my office at Kyoto Institute of Technology. By the time I left, it started out as rice fields, turned out to be all these houses around the university. This is how babies are carried. You can't see very well, but being carried this way, they all have this beatific smile. They're all very calm. You never see a baby crying like this. Here's a family. Oh, So people in Japan love to travel in groups, as you know, I think. I love this picture. And their ashes are in groups. So you can go to an ash apartment, pick out your urn of your loved one, or get your own urn and decide what apartment urn, what urn part your apartment is in. Little kids for a festival. Uh, drinking water this way from a well is very popular. Not very sanitary. There was a German restaurant in Osaka. For some reason, that struck me as very funny. <laughs> German food, German umpa, <laughs> German everything, German hats. You know, in America, that wouldn't be funny. But in Japan, somehow, it was very funny. Um, women had some interesting jobs. Here's one digging up the street in her bonnet and her apron. 
So here I am um, having one of these formal dinners with um, my husband's colleagues and their wives or my colleagues or whatever. So we had to sit that way on our knees for the whole dinner. And in, when I was studying Zazen, sitting Zen, I had to sit for 45 minutes, not in this position, not on my knees, but on the cross-legged position that you see the Buddha sitting in, which is supposed to be the most stable position, not a very feminine position. Sit there for 45 minutes at a stretch. I didn't think I could do it, but I did it. You don't move anything. You do not move a muscle. <laughs> but fortunately, I learned I would sit at night uh, for maybe uh, two hours. And there was an ofuro, a Japanese bath, right near the temple. Oh, they were wonderful. And I would go and soak in the hot water. <laughs> it was wonderful. Toji is a very interesting shrine. So once a month they have a big, like, garage sale there. And in the corner was these used um, kimonos that we would always cherish. I think this is part of another festival, huh? significance of which I don't know. My daughter was teaching these kids English. I can't remember where they came from. I think around the neighborhood. So these shoes are geta. And in one form or another, uh, women wore them with their kimonos. and people wore them and they were designed to for workers in sushi shops who worked with raw fish and there was a lot of water on the floor and this kept them above the water but in our little house besides the trolley barn which was very noisy in the trolleys you would hear the clump of getta all night long because they're wooden shoes <laughs> not easy to walk in this is a karate practitioner. Um, this is very strange. This is our guy that was in the house that I showed you with, with Claudia, now called Kamala. So this is a um, kind of <laughs> description of a man in Japan, an herbivore man, a social phenomenon in Japan characterized by men who shun marriage or having a girlfriend. They have a non-assertive, indifferent attitude toward desires of the flesh. Can you imagine such a person in this country? Mm -hmm. Surveys of single Japanese men found that 61% of men in their 20s and 70% of men in their 30s consider themselves to be herbivores. This phenomenon is viewed by the Japanese government as a leading cause in the nation's declining birth rate, prompting the government to provide incentives for couples that have children, including pay payouts and free health care. Very interesting phenomenon. This combined with the fact that women, of course, are not married. I don't know if this man is an herbivore or not. So these are some gardens. These are little statues, Shinto statues, Jizo-san. This was not our house. We did not have a traditional Japanese house. This is very unusual to see these Western instruments. This is a, a, a kabuki show. Women wear their traditional uh, overgarments when they go to kabuki. Kabuki lasts all day long. You can go out, buy an obento, bring it in, eat your lunch. Classical Japanese drama. And you, well, if you came in while they were showing um, some kabuki, I'll show you a little bit. It's very bizarre. The singing is very bizarre in a high-pitched tone. There's a lot of dying, long-term dying. I mean, somebody stabs himself, does... Um, what's the ritual dying call? I can't remember now. Um, harakiri. Oh, the hara is the center of the soul, and kiri is stabbing so that you stab yourself, not in your heart, but in your bowel. It takes a long time to die, and a lot of... Kabuki is people dying of harakiri. And of course all male roles are all female roles are played by males. Mm -hmm. 
no is, is sort of the opposite. It's very quiet, very subtle. And Kyogen is these comedy things that occur during no intermissions. And Bunraku is a form of puppet theater. I don't know how many of you saw The Lion King or the... Um, Music. That's not Bunraku music. Um, the latest um, Magic Flute, the Julie Tamer designs the sets, and she uses a lot of masks from Japanese theater, as well as Indonesian puppets. She's quite amazing, I think. So what you see here is three men dressed in black operating one puppet. And the illusion, of course, is that you don't see these men. It's a very interesting form of theater. These are puppets. Uh, this is a kabuki actor. I don't know how much time. Not much. That's the sound of Kabuki. He's coming off stage now. Kabuki actor, the third in his line to hold the given name of Enrosuke. And Ichikawa, his family name, is one of the greatest in the Kabuki and one of the oldest. Enrosuke, though one of the finest of classical Kabuki actors, is unique in that he's equally interested in both popularizing the art and in reviving the older plays and the older styles of the I'm going to skip this, but. If you have a chance to go to YouTube and watch Kabuki um, things, it, it's, it's a very interesting art form. It's amazing how little we know about Japan and what an amazingly rich culture this is. My daughter trying to play a Japanese instrument. Um, after Japan, we happened to go a, a long trip, but we went wound up in Africa and we went to a Japanese restaurant right away and we had Irishai Mase all this stuff, and in the back were all these African cooks making very good Japanese food, African waiter. Black people in Japan are not regarded highly at all, so he is definitely not in Japan. A whole other story about that. <laughs> Lots of stories about black, white stuff in Japan. So I came back in 2004, I had a meeting in Tokyo, and I went to visit, this is my friend, um, and I always called him Mr. Akita, even though we were absolutely best friends. We drank together, we went together everywhere. He was a wonderful friend. His wife is an ophthalmologist. She doesn't speak any, uh, very little English. And I went with my friend Lois. So we had gone around the country and then we came back to Kyoto and uh, Mr. Akita, who died, unfortunately, uh, about a year later, um, showed us around. But first we went to Hakone, which is a beautiful mountain resort near um, Fujiyama. <coughs> and there's a marvelous outdoor art museum with wonderful contemporary art. Um, there's a whole Picasso show back here, all out of doors. This is a Henry Moore here. What is that? That's, uh, yeah, what's his name? No, no, it's not her. <laughs> no, not her. No, Nikki Sanfal, no. Um, for some reason there was this pirate ship. And this cute little train that went through Hakone. Very conscientious young driver market day in one of the cities we were in and uh, an old reconstructed city with all these um, ancient arts. They're ancient but they're still going on. This is us in our Ryokan. It was cold by the way. And the um, food was served to us in all these little dishes. So of course we could wear our jeans and I didn't have to sit on the floor. This is uh, a mother teaching her son how to dance. Uh, Mr. Kita is, um, was a psychologist interested in ergonomics. He had a usual, because he had his PhD from Columbia, he spent some time in America 
to his usual home was built as an American home. But he also built a traditional Japanese home with the paper uh, walls and the sliding doors and the tatami on the floor and this wonderful china, which he didn't use except to entertain. And so we had this wonderful meal that he and his wife prepared for us in this traditional home. But it was also, he built it as a demonstration to show that people with disabilities could live in a traditional home. So there were extra wide hallways, extra wide doorways, bathrooms were designed for people with wheelchairs. Very interesting. He's a wonderful man, Mr. Akita. Um, so this is what I said before about Japanese food. This is my friend Lois having her kaiseki served in the uh, ryokan. And you know, here Japanese food is associated with sushi, which is a very small part of what people eat. Very small part. Although, you know, it's very delicious there and very expensive. Um, portions are very small. Buddhists used to be vegetarians. Some still are, but not usually. Rice and noodles are plentiful, especially at night. If you're walking around at night and you've just seen the show, there are noodle stands where you can get hot noodles. Where we meditated at night in the um, Buddhist temple, we were served noodles. So I was eating my noodles, and two minutes later she came and collected them, or he, I guess it was a monk, came and collected the noodles, and I hadn't even started yet. Because when they swallowed the noodles whole, in fact, the cause of death mostly was stomach cancer because these hot noodles would go down in about two gulps. We used to eat lunch at Kyoto University. At 12 o'clock, you go in, you have your lunch. At 12.05, there's this giant sucking sound. <laughs> Slurp, slurping down the noodles. At 12.10, everybody was gone. They had already slurped their noodles. <laughs> Very interesting. McDonald's is very popular. My children, who were not raised on McDonald's, when we got to Tokyo, said, because we were going to uh, a play, they said, can we go to McDonald's? OK. And they found their way somehow from our hotel to the Ginza, where they went to the most popular McDonald's in the world. Children got very self-reliant in Japan. They, they did very well finding their way around. So this is uh, the train system, and it's a very big part of their transportation. It's very excellent. It's private, run by private companies, and it carries 22 billion passengers a year in comparison with uh, Germany, which has more rail lines but only carries 2 billion passengers a year. And it has uh, 46 of the world's busiest rail stations. This is a beautiful cemetery that uh, Mr. Kita took us to on a foggy, misty morning. And even though it was right near my house, I don't remember ever having been there before. And a lot of famous people, authors, um, painters, writers, you know, I said that, are buried there, or part of their ashes are buried there. Beautiful cemetery. In Gion, the old quarter where the geisha are, are a lot of these little sake joints. They're very pretty. They hold maybe 12 or 14 people at the bar, if that many. They serve delicious Japanese food, including raw meat and soups. And you can drink sake there all night, or at least till midnight when they close. So Mr. Kita took us to his one of his favorites. This man knew him very well. And when I was there, living there, I used to go with him and another American guy who taught English at Kyoto Institute of Technology. And then they shove everybody into taxis at 12 o'clock. People are very drunk, just shoved into a taxi and go home. What are you holding, Faye? Is that a fan? Yeah, I still have that fan. Yeah. This is, uh, you make your wish, another Shinto thing. This is how we were served our kaiseki dinner in our ryokan. Now she's sitting on her knees. A lot of people, she, she, this is uh, the Akita's daughter. A lot of young women are bow-legged because of this sitting on the knees thing. 
So she's 33 years old, a very pretty girl, uh, with a very responsible position, and she still lives at home. <laughs> and she's one of these people who, instead of marriage, partakes in a lifestyle centered on friends, work, and spending a large amount of money uh, on, on things and clothes, and um, living with her parents. So she, they've been called parasitic singles, and some young woman reacted by creating business cards with their names in the title, parasitic single, because they're pretty proud of that, I think. It is funny, it's very strange, but it's the reason that and these herbivore men for the declining birth rate. Lovely young woman. So these are two of the instruments I mentioned before, the shakuhachi and the shamisen. These happen to be women playing the shamisen at a Japanese festival at a Japanese temple in Vista. You know, if you look around here, you can find plenty of Japanese festivals, plenty of Japanese food in, uh, I don't know, three, two Japanese temples or more around the city. And they're very welcoming to people. This is another martial art. It's uh, with sticks. And again, this is their philosophy. You don't have to hear the whole thing, but to mold the mind and body, to cultivate a vigorous spirit, and through correct and rigid training to strive for improvement in the art of kendo. That's what it's all about. It's not about killing people, killing your opponent, destroying people. It's about spiritual development and respect for the other person, respect for your opponent and your country. So um, this was sword, swords, but now it's sticks. This is a beautiful scene around. So in retrospect, to sum up my impressions, uh, my year in Japan was one of the most challenging because I was always lost, couldn't read a thing, could hardly speak. Most interesting, most unusual years I've ever spent. And my family agrees. It was so worth doing. And it's when I learned that non-Western civilizations to me are more interesting than Western civilizations. And my kids are now parents, as I said, in their 50s. Uh, Japan is an extremely sophisticated civilization. In its self-discipline is reflected in the martial arts, the handling crisis. You saw what happened with the tsunami, and people were helping each other, adjusting to their problems. The martial arts, the theater, the architecture, and other arts, flower arranging, tea ceremony, their dress, their pottery, their gardening, their music. The, the self-discipline involved in these things, to me, is remarkable. I've never seen that anywhere. It's very an insular country. For many years it was insular, before the Meiji era, after Admiral Perry came with his ship and they copied the ship. Then Japan became closed to all foreigners. So it was a very insular country. It's still very insular. And this book, like We Japanese, is an indication of that. And part of it is they don't speak English very well. The traditional arts and Buddhism are not as important as they used to be, but still very influential in the whole country and the whole culture. Paradox is everywhere. People are gentle and kind and polite, but also violent and cruel. There's amazing beauty and also terrible noise, air pollution, and graffiti. Kyoto and Tokyo are very, very different places, sort of like San Diego is to Los Angeles, except more so. As are Hokkaido, which is very cold, and Kyushu, which is very tropical. Kyushu is a very interesting place with these hells, which is different color boiling waters that come out of the earth. Public transportation is excellent in Japan. Being an age society is a real problem. And what they're going to do about it is a real question. And population decline. I don't know of any other countries except very, very poor countries that have population decline. There's almost no immigration. They, very pure, don't want. Koreans cannot become Japanese citizens, even if they've lived there for three generations. The first article of the Constitution is 
harmony. So you very rarely see people arguing in public or any kind of um, dissension. They do, of course, but and uniformity is very highly prized. They think our effort to be individuals, although you saw these news Tokyo girls, is um, pathetic. <laughs> so they don't mind the school children being dressed all alike. So I think more attention should be paid to this amazing country. And if you have an opportunity to go there, spend as much time there as you can. Because if you go there for three or four days, you see a thousand temples in two hours, and it's all a big blur. I had friends coming on these tours, and I rescued them. And instead of going on to see all these temples, we walked around our neighborhood. I took them to an Ofuro, a bath, or our local temple, our local noodle restaurant, which was a lot more interesting. So. Here's two words for you, arigato, thank you, and sayonara.